We have another very special guest right, right now, which I'm very excited to talk to you about. His name is Neil Oliver. He is a Scottish archaeologist, historian, television presenter. You may have seen him presenting or fronting Coast New Zealand, which was made uh, a few years back. And uh, oh, he did some great pieces. He was He's a natural presenter, Neil, a great man of the people. And he's attracting quite a bit of publicity around the world at the moment for his outspoken views on GB News in the UK. Uh, he does uh, regular features on this. And uh, some people have uh, laid into him, the likes of Billy Bragg, etc., uh, for his views. But he is it's a very interesting and intelligent man so I was delighted to have a chat with him earlier on today we talked from his home or oh, I talked from Queenstown and he chatted to me from his home in Stirling Scotland and here is the first segment of the interview uh, you know as, as you know uh, I spent uh, some time in New Zealand and and love it uh, you know, I've got so many memories, all of them bound up with my family and with your family. Um, and so, you know, seeing you and hearing your voice just uh, takes me back to a lot of happy days. So it's it's a lovely opportunity just to catch up with you. Mm. Yes, uh, I have I have been on a bit of a bit of a uh, a, a trajectory uh, over the last couple of years. It is unexpected. Um, I think when uh, when the pandemic started and lockdown came in, I was not not instantly, you know, I, 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 like many people, like most people, when it started, it was a very uncertain time. What, what was COVID? What did it mean? How dangerous? What was to be done for the best? But within a few weeks, really, I felt that we, that we were going in the wrong direction. And I started to speak out about that, and uh, on a, on radio and anywhere else that I was given a, an opportunity to speak, I simply started saying, "I think there's a, another way to do this, and I don't think this is right. And I think if we lock down in this way, it's going to have dreadful consequences economically and in terms of people's well-being." Um, and, and then, well, well, here we are, two years later. Uh, and we're still in the residue. We're still in the in the backwash of of lockdown. And uh, I, 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 for one, think that things are only going to get worse in many ways. And I've continued to speak out, and I'll continue to do so. Didn't ever mean to be controversial. Didn't mean to. Didn't set out to be a contrarian. But here we are. It's an incredible turnaround from from those days of being a well-known TV historian and archaeologist and doing all those beautiful shows and bringing joy to people. And you were so good at telling those stories from the past. And now you're concerned about the future, which I get, because we're not in a great place. And I think, you know, I, I heard a news bulletin just before about, uh, about things in New Zealand. And, uh, yeah, everything's pretty haywire, isn't it? So do you feel, you feel this compulsion to, to keep talking? Yes, I do. I'm very worried about uh, about the the well being of 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 people of the species. To be quite honest, I think it's demonstrable that the that lockdown and its various uh, manifestations in your country of New Zealand, here in the UK, what I've seen of it playing out in North America, South America, all across Europe, Australia. Uh, I think lockdown has been uh, a disastrous. Uh, set of uh, uh, ideas uh, and I think it, it was demonstrably the case that it was the wrong way to go long ago I think it was it became clear long ago that it was going to have dreadful ramifications and consequences um, and and it, that, Neil, it, it was a whole new ball game wasn't it in a way although we've had pandemics in the past so to be to, to, to just be devil's advocate I mean weren't people just trying everything wasn't it just a shock yes it was a fright it was a fright it was a fright we didn't know what we were dealing with it came out of china mm -hmm. uh it, it's looking increasingly likely that it was it leaked from a from a lab in wuhan uh accidentally or whatever but it came out of that out of that lab and the, the background to that lab is murky you know there, there seems to be also there seem to have been all sorts of you know the us and, and others seem to have been involved in, in in financing that that operation so it's been a it, it, it's a it's a murky story that we haven't got to the bottom of, but that seems to be where it came from. Mm -hmm. And then here in, well, in Europe, we first of all saw the pictures coming out of China, then the the panic in Italy, uh, and then the the idea of lockdowns spread rapidly from there. Mm -hmm. 
And before we knew where we were, we were locked down in the UK. And as I said, for the first few weeks, it seemed, well, OK, let's, let's see what this is. What, what are we dealing with? But, but I, I think, and many other people, it, it became apparent within weeks, if not the first few months, that all was not as it had first appeared. It, it rapidly became apparent that the, that the disease was affecting the very old and the very ill. Uh, and it seemed uh, appropriate that the very old and the very ill should be protected and that everybody else should be able to go about their business. But that was shouted down. And once the shouting down began, it never stopped. And in fact, it only got louder and crueler, uh, such that anyone with, a, with an alternative opinion who believed that there ought to be a different way to look at the situation was just ridiculed. Mm. Uh, so, if not, so divisive. Yes, it was so people were shamed into silence. Some of the most preeminent scientists, uh, people from the from with backgrounds in virology and epidemiology, medical professionals across the board, scientists of every stripe, were coming forward and saying, "This isn't the right way to do this." We, sh we at the very least, we need to have a conversation about it. But it was increasingly and ever more hysterically shouted down. And and as the as the voices shouting down dissent became louder, I became more and more upset mm. and more and more determined that something was badly wrong. I think it, it, at, the, at the bottom of it all, all, in the past you mentioned that there had been pandemics before and, and yes there have been and there, was a, there, was a, there had been plans laid for pandemic response mm. and the, the pandemic response that was pre-prepared was that in the event of uh, a, a pandemic then people who were uh, Broadly speaking, the, the vulnerable would be prioritised and shielded, and everyone else, everyone else would be would be encouraged to go about their normal business. That was the plan, but the model that was taken that overturned all of that was the Chinese model, the Chinese model, you know, driven by the CCP, loudly cheer led by the World Health Organization which you know many people believe is in the pocket of the of the of the Chinese communist party went for lockdown total lockdown mm -hmm. that was unprecedented in the past in the case of a pandemic you might seek to isolate the infected mm -hmm. but never before was it policy to lock down healthy people right P people who were people yeah. who were fine mm -hmm. you know where where people were were you know were symptomatic and demonstrably ill and likely to spread the, the infection would be encouraged. Well, most people do anyway. I mean, for, for our lifetimes, if you had flu or a bad virus of any sort, sensible people just stayed at home, didn't they? Mm. You'd say, I'm not, I'm not taking this into the office and you're not going to school, in, 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 in school John or Jane. Exactly. We'll keep you in till you're, till you're clear. That was, how no, that was how normal, sensible people operated anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, and that would have been the abiding wisdom. But this idea of lockdown, locking down the healthy, was imported from China. And suddenly that was that was enforced upon us, and it, it, people were from the very beginning many very, many many voices, qualified voices, scientific voices, people with a background in healthcare, both physical and and mental healthcare were saying no, this is disastrous. Also, people from an economic background were saying no. If you do this, if you shut down the economies, if you bring the juggernaut of of uh, Western economies to a standstill, it will be catastrophic. Mm -hmm. All of that was shouted down. That's what they did. And here in the aftermath, this is where we find ourselves now. And to some extent, I think the worst is yet to come. We've had two years of dealing specifically with the pandemic, yeah. dealing with it badly and dealing with it in a way that I think to me and to many people made no sense. But it's like that, it's like that moment in the disaster movies when the, when the asteroid strikes Right. And and you've got the you know so the so the the way the water disappears from the beach, and that's where we are now. People are on the beach going, where did all the sea go? Mm -hmm. And we all know what happens next. The tsunami builds beyond the horizon, and then it comes rushing back in and causes its devastation. I think that's where we are now. We're on the beach, and the tsunami of economic and other consequences is rolling back towards us, and we're now going to reap the whirlwind of what was sown two years ago with the lockdown. You're a father and you talked about the, the, all of the ramifications of how we tackled this and mental health is a huge uh, part of 
of, of, of well, has, has been impacted probably the most of anything, hasn't it? I mean, obviously economically, but people, the, the fear and the and, and the young and, and what the young people have had to sort of endure. And you're a dad, and you, you, you must wonder about your children and how how they've come through this. Personally. Very much. I've got uh, my my uh, my children. My my eldest daughter is uh, nineteen now. Uh, my and my boys are sixteen and fourteen. Mm. And so, you know, to rewind that, they were about sixteen, uh, thirteen, and eleven. You know, uh, eleven or twelve. Mm. You know, when this started, and now they're you know now they're nineteen, sixteen, and fourteen, mm. and we've seen them struggle. Uh, good days and bad days. Uh, we're very, you know, we're very close with the kids. They're all still, you know, they're all still living at home. Uh, they go to school, but they go to school just during the day. You know, they, they you know, they're, they're, they're day students. They come back and forth from state school, and we've been able to kind of keep on top of them, so to speak. But they've been anxious without a shadow of a doubt. Our youngest is, has been, you know, has been, I think, probably the most obviously affected by it. You know, his anxieties have been, you know, have been very obvious. He's fine, but you know we've had to, you know we've had to keep him going. Uh, and and our, our eldest, our daughter, you know she's been through some very anxious times. You know, not knowing what to do. She she left school and started university. Mm. You know, during this, her universe, her first year of university has been well suboptimal. Let's say no face to face learning. Uh, she didn't. Mm. She didn't go away to university. She's done it from home. Uh, she was, you know, she was watching pre recorded lectures. Uh, she's largely been self-taught. She's had to be self-motivated, self-starting. She's done pretty well, mm-hmm. uh, but it's been not the not the kind of first year at university that that you or I remember and, and that we would want for our kids. Mm-hmm. But all around us, my goodness, the the figures are there. Uh, you know, other people have been even have been much more affected. Uh, you know, the, the evidence is there of people with suicidal thoughts. Uh, you know, people, you know, deeply anxious, deeply depressed. All the evidence is there of the very young, you know, toddlers and, uh, you know, babies and very young children with, with uh, arrested development, uh, speech difficulties, uh, g- general development about socialising uh, and, and starting nursery school and starting early learning, all of it compromised. And we're going to be dealing with the, with the consequences of that for Goodness knows, these some of these kids will be dealing with for lifetimes. They've been set on on different paths, on account of having spent two years isolated, not playing, not going through normal, uh, you know, none of the the landmark events that that, that punctuate lives, birthday parties, graduations yeah. from school, yeah. normal exams, normal socialising. All of that's been taken from them. Mm-hmm. If you're four, you've spent half of your life in lockdown. You know, it's one thing if you're a hundred years old and two years is, you know, is is only a small percentage of a, of your life. Mm-hmm. But for youngsters, mm-hmm. two, three, four, five, six years old, lockdown has been, you know, the the, the majority of their lives, mm-hmm. and we will be reaping and dealing with the consequences of that for decades to come. Mm-hmm. It's it's been it's been an awful time, but it's also been a, a learning time, hasn't it? And and brought a lot of changes for you with with getting into GB News. How did how did you first? Were you reluctant to take on such a high profile role? Like, did a part of you think this is terrific and I'm getting a following? But on the other half, do you hate the way that people are so uh, so quick to judge and to and to be negative about some of your comments? Does that bother you at all? It's a good question. Um, I, I, honestly, yes, it does. It does. It does bother me. I'll tell you how. It, I'll tell you what happened. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, when lockdown began, most of my work just disappeared. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I, I, for, for example, I would have been. Uh, my plans had been that I was going to go on another uh, public speaking tour. Yeah, right. I'd had. I'd, I'd spent a couple of years hiring theatres mm-hmm. and doing a kind of a one man show. I used to go out on stage every night and do a two hour long you show. Didn't- in Auckland, I saw you a few years back. Uh, yeah, 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 Ab- absolutely. I've done, I've it was done, great. I've done that. I've done that. So that that kind of thing that yeah. all that all disappeared with lockdown, as, as it did. I mean, heavens above, uh, uh, you know, people's people's work disappeared all over. Yes. Um, and so I went into this kind of like many people, I went into this strange limbo. Right. Um, and I, I began a couple of podcasts. Uh, I got in touch with a, a good friend of mine from you know television days past, and we we agreed that we would do a, a podcast. And so I got those things up and running. I still had my book. I was I was I write books. 
But a lot of other things disappeared. Now, it, it so happened because I had a, a little bit of a presence on Twitter, right? The social media platform. Mm. Uh, I, I was contacted by um, a, a, a radio uh, DJ, um, Mike Graham, who worked for Talk Radio. Uh-huh. And he was interested in some of the things that I was putting out on on the social media platform, and he said, "Do you want to come on the on the radio show every Wednesday? We'll do a we'll do a half an hour slot together on every Wednesday morning." I said, "Absolutely." It was a, it was a completely vol- an unpaid thing. Right. I mean, it was just something to something to do, something to do. Something, con- <laughs> something constructive. Yes. And so M- Mike and I started talking for those for that half hour on a Wednesday, and it it. it it generated a bit of an audience and people were interested in what Mike and I were talking about and what, what we were saying during that half hour. Yeah. Uh, it lasted for a few months and then uh, GB News started as a startup. Uh, and right from the very beginning, right, right, right before the launch, they approached me, yeah. uh, it, it interested to see if I would like to come on the channel. And I said, yes. Um, and I said yes for all sorts of reasons. You know, I've worked in television for twenty odd years, and you know, it's a it's a natural uh, you know milieu f- environment for me. Yeah. So I was I was keen in that respect, uh, but also because I knew it was going to be some it was going to be an opportunity to talk about the issues of the day. Yeah. And I thought this is you know terrific. I was going to have a, like a two hours on a Saturday night to talk to guests and yeah. you know and air the air the conversation. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I knew I knew it was always going to be controversial because the mainstream media here in the UK and everywhere around the world mm. has largely been in lockstep with governments. There's been an, an, you know, a, a shameful degree to which most of the media, not all, but most media, high BBC here, Channel 4, uh, ITV, the, the, the high profile media, Got into lockstep with the government narrative, and from the big, from the get go, it was plain that GB News were going to be different, yeah. and they were going to allow people to air the unspoken opinions. That which wasn't being said was going to get the time of day on GB News, and I thought, well, terrific, high time. Mm. And so for the last, it started in June last year, and it's been you know it's been going great guns ever since. Mm-hmm. And yes, it's been it's been a, it's been challenging in as much as it's there's been a lot of opposition, you know, pushing back against GB News and saying that we shouldn't be giving airtime to the voices who have been giving airtime, and we shouldn't be saying the things that we're saying, and it has been uncomfortable without without a shadow of a doubt some of it, but it has also been incredibly invigorating. It's a great team. Mm-hmm. There's a great uh, esprit de corps. Right. Uh, within the organisation, it's been very much people are saying we're in, we're all in this yes. together, uh-huh. and we'll you know we'll we'll be on each other's shoulders, and we'll 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 you know we'll we'll do this as as a unit, mm. and uh, and so it's been in, it's been inspirational. A lot of uh, you know I'm well you know I'm 55, but there's a lot of the team are in their twenties, you know, so young people at the start of their careers. Mm. Uh, who've, who've put a lot on the line, actually, you know, to, to start their careers in broadcasting in something as controversial as GB News. They're, you right. know, so they're, they're in there. Right. They've, they've taken a they've taken a, a, a slightly uncomfortable position, yeah. and God love them. You know, they've they've they're in it and they're doing it, and it's been a mm. it's been I've I've found it hugely educational, hugely inspirational. Mm. Yes, there's brickbats being thrown, but. Hell, you know, so what? <laughs> bring it, bring it. The platform, this new radio show, I don't want to talk about me much, but there, I was impressed. I went to Wellington and I saw uh, the studio up there and, and the staff there, 21-year-olds, refreshing, great young people who, again, are taking on something different. And it, and it goes to show that not necessarily, you know, just because you're tw- young, that you subscribe to the way that, you know, state media is operating and, and the views yes. of the world. So these, it's, it's really refreshing and, and quite lovely to, to see that. And I think they're a little uh, tired of having to live in a very precious world where you tiptoe around issues. So I, I totally understand what, what you're saying and, that, and, and how that can be invigorating for you. One thing I did mm. that I, I saw that, uh, you know, you, you, when you Google your name, there's a lot, it's a lot online nowadays. No, oh, God help you. And, you know, <laughs> Billy Bragg, for goodness sakes, um, called you shameful. And I'm, I'm like, really? Because I think you said, you said that you would cheerfully risk catching COVID for the sake of your personal freedom. And so Billy Bragg has, has said that um, 
uh, what did he say? Oh, he, he, he put on a post and, uh, and you know, I, I suppose a lot of people in the UK thought, oh, Billy Bragg, he's, he's so famous, we'll support him. And yeah, Neil's, um, you know, on the wrong team. But, but how do you think I thought, about stuff like that? Well, what I actually said was, I remember it specifically, I said, if, 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 if my catching COVID from you is the price that has to be paid for your freedom, then so be it. Okay. And if you have to catch COVID from me, you, you know, as the price of my freedom, then so be it. Because for me, individual freedom is, is the number one. You know, so as I feel about all the flu, you know, every year you go about, you know, a certain number of people uh, uh, catch flu every year. And, and some people are very badly affected by it every year and some people die. Yeah. But it doesn't stop me going about my business. Mm. And I wouldn't ask, I wouldn't demand that other people be locked in their houses for fear that I catch flu. And likewise, yes, if you're out mixing, we're social animals, we mix in the herd. And some, you know, you, you catch things from one another. Yeah. You spread conversations, you spread ideas, you spread love, and you also spread infections. That's just in the nature of being a population of, of human animals. Mm. And that is a, that is, that's all in the, in the rough and tumble of, of life. If, and if I, if I happen to catch flu from being on the bus with you or, or having a, a, a conversation with you for five minutes, that's a chance I'm prepared to take. Sure. I'll do that. I think, that's, I think that's right and I think that's normal. Because we know the, the world is not one hundred percent safe. Neither it can neither can it be made one hundred percent safe. And quite frankly, nor should it be. No, you know, exactly. a world that's one hundred percent safe and sterile and yeah. uh, you know and and bubble wrapped and all the rest of it. I want nothing to do with. I, I want to be out there taking my chances with you know the lightning strikes. And that's that's all part of the that's all part of life. And so that's what I said. And that's, that's the comment that, and it was, it was misquoted and, or, or reinterpreted by various people and, you know, but whatever, but again, Billy Bragg, freedom of speech is another thing that I'll stand and fall in the face of if Billy Bragg wants to take a pop at me, fine. Yeah. Uh, good, good luck to him. And I've given the opportunity, I would have replied to him, but you know, that, that's not, that's not how things worked out. That is fine. It's fine. People can people can have their opinions about what I said. I'll have opinions about what they say, and that's 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 all fine. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the uh, another something much much more dangerous than COVID was the, was the cancelling and the silencing and the censorship and the deplatforming uh, and all that went along with uh, the 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 way in which uh, information about the pandemic was circulated by governments by media. Mm -hmm. I think that was far more pernicious and far more sinister. Um, and that was, I found that far more worrying as time went on. And so what I've, what I've all, I mean, I've never been a rebellious person. I mean, I've always been a law abiding, you yeah. know, head down sort of a person. This right. was the first right. time in my life where I felt, no, this is, something's badly wrong here. Right. This is wrong. It was as though there was some sort of reptilian part of my brain that had been dormant for my whole life right. was right. suddenly snapped into yeah. oh. life. Mm -hmm. And it, you know that that little that little lizard tail flicked for the first time in my head, and I thought, "Hold on." This and it's it was yeah. partly about the pandemic, but it was about many more things besides. And that 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 um, that that uh, momentum that built up so quickly about silencing people, silencing and ridiculing dissent, making people feel bad, casting people out, making pariah of people for having an alternative opinion and then when 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 the coercion kicked in about the vaccines mm. and people were told you know get this or you can't go to the pub yeah. get this or you'll never be able to travel you know yeah. get this or you'll lose your job mm. that's wrong mm. that i found that to be immoral Do you and know i feel like to just interrupt. When 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 COVID first happened, and I remember because I've never had vaccines in my life, my family were a little bit anti it. So when I remember watching coverage of it and saying, "Oh, we can't wait for the vaccine," and I remember saying to my family, "Oh, I'm not that keen on doing that. Actually, it seems a bit experimental to me, <laughs> but too soon." And and you know, um, and then of course, so I was I was quite glad there wasn't a vaccine. And when it came, this this incredible push was just phenomenal in New Zealand. It was like all of a sudden we went from elimination to to vaccination and it was like it was just in your face 24-7 to the point where it was just so hard to avoid and I still was anti it. But um, 
you know, I, I caved in because I felt that I wouldn't be able to live in the future if I didn't, if I didn't get it. The, the pressure was wrong it, for, for many reasons. Um, it, was, it, was, it still is uh, an, un, an un, untested procedure in as much as there's, there's no long-term data. Mm. Uh, nor can there be because we haven't had oh, these vaccines <laughs> for, more than a, for more than a year or so. That's at, right. At, a couple of years at most, as far as we can tell. Mm. I mean, if these vaccines were brought out of a cupboard and they'd been in the and they'd been in the makings for ten years. Well, we don't know that yet. Right. What we've been told is that they're brand new, yeah. and so there's no long-term data about their their effect. And at the very least, you have to allow for some people, for whatever reason, being hesitant about that, and that doesn't make them tin hat wearing swivel-eyed lunatics. Right. People people genuinely wanting to wait, wait and see, is a completely reasonable stance. Yeah. And the, the pressure that was brought to bear, which was, well, you'll lose your job. Yeah. You'll never be able to get on a plane. Right. You can't leave the country. You can't go to that country unless you've undertaken this medical procedure. Mm-hmm. Again, that was the lizard bit of my brain. That little tail flicked and said, that's not right. Mm-hmm. You can't do that. Mm-hmm. It, you know, it, it, it make, make the thing available and allow people in a free society to make the choice. Yeah. That's fine. I, and I would never have put myself in the position of saying, Take it, don't take it. Uh-huh. I, I, my my position was only let people make that decision for themselves. Uh-huh. Mm. And and to and this pressure that built up was such that if you don't take the vaccine, then someone else's vaccine doesn't work. Mm. That never made any sense to me. You know, that's like saying to me, you know, I have to wear a nappy so that you don't wet yourself in yours. Yeah. That it never made sense to me that I had to do something the same as you. Or your, or your, whatever your medical procedure was, wouldn't work. Mm. You know, if you're taking an aspirin for your headache, I've got to take it as well. Mm. But that, but anyway, mm. it's a, you know, that's a, that's a conversation for another day. The point was, make the vaccines available and whoever wants them can take them. But right. the people that don't want to take them, leave them alone and don't discriminate against them. All, yes. of, those, all of those aspects of, of how the situation was handled Mm. Uh, are part of the building blocks that have assembled themselves for me in my head where from the beginning and and with every day that passes I have thought there's something else going on here this isn't about health this is about control this is a situation that is being exploited by those who want control and if it hadn't been the covid pandemic they would have they would have exploited some other opportunity to get everybody whipped into line and once I felt that that was what was happening, I just rebelled against it for the first time in my life and thought, no, I'm not having that. Now there's talk about this, uh, the, the WHO, the World Health Organization Pandemic Treaty, you know, to which, you know, 194 member states are, you know, are, are contemplating signing up to this treaty. Mm-hmm. Which would, which would, yeah. yeah, which would cede national sovereignty on health emergencies to the WHO, which is an unelected, unaccountable uh, organisation of, of faceless bureaucrats who would be able to dictate how we as individuals in our own countries would res- would have to respond in the face of a pandemic or another as yet undescribed medical emergency. Mm. Now, that, it, no, I, I just say no to that. Mm. You know, I will, I, that's, a, that's a yoke of tyranny under which I will not live. And I certainly won't take that kind of diktat from people that I can't vote out. Mm. It's, it's one thing to contemplate what our own elected governments are doing, because every four or five years, hypothetically, at least you get the opportunity to get rid of them. Mm-hmm. I'm, not taking, I'm not taking instructions about taking a vaccine or being locked in my home from an unelected, unaccountable bureaucracy in Geneva. <laughs> that, I, that I do not get invited, uh, you know, I have no say over. That, seems that's a non-starter simple, for me. Really, it just seems plain common sense, doesn't it? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not doing that. They can, the, the WHO can, the, the, my government in the UK can sign up to that treaty if it wants. I'll ignore it. If, if, if that treaty is passed and, and diktats come down from the WHO saying that I must do this and I must do that, I won't. Mm. I, and I'll take the consequences, but I won't, I will not... Uh, uh, bow down to an unelected bureaucracy that I've had no opportunity to vote for and that I can't vote out. Mm. 
Okay. Neil, I have a question. Have you had friends say to you, wow, what's happened to you? You used to be so different. Do you ever get that line? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I, I, I do. I do. I have to say, Leanne, I, I've had an, an enormous, an enormous, um, almost overwhelming amount of support. You know, I've received letters from around the world, thousands of letters. It started one or two people were writing to me as Neil Oliver, Stirling, Scotland. Yeah. And the letters were finding their way to me. Mm -hmm. And I started tweeting photographs of the envelopes and they were coming to, you know, the long haired guy off the telly and, you know, the guy from coast. And, and then eventually it was things like to the King of Scotland and all sorts of, <laughs> all sorts of madness, you know, and it was lovely. And I was, they were a real, it was re very uplifting at, at Christmas time just passed. I was probably getting 50, 50 Christmas cards a day. Wow. And messages from people I, I didn't know. Yeah. And they were all turning up just without my proper address on, but the, the post office. And they were coming in from New Zealand, Australia, Asia, Africa, yeah. North America, South America, you name it. Mm -hmm. They were coming in from everywhere. So I've had this enormous amount of support. And, and while I know that the criticism is out there, people aren't critical to my face. You know, I, I, I don't, you know, people two or three people a day come up to me in the street and shake my hand and, and say that they, you know, that they get a great deal of comfort from hearing the things that I say. In two years, I haven't had a single person come up to me and say the other, say the, the, the other, the, the alternative to that. Mm. And, and, and yes, so in answer to your question, you know, friends have said, you know, how did this happen? And indeed my wife, Trudy, who you know, uh -huh. uh, Trudy has said to me, you know, we look at each other across the, the breakfast table and from time to time. And sometimes Trudy says, how did this happen to us? Because obviously she's in it with me now. Of course. You know, we're in it sh shoulder to shoulder. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, and, you know, and she sees the things that I write and she, you know, she casts her eye over them and we, you know, she approves or disapproves. We talk about things before I say them and before oh. I do them. So we're very much a team in this. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, so, you know, so she's experiencing it as well. Not quite at first hand, but, but a very close second hand. You know, she's experiencing it and going through it as well. Mm. And we look at each other and say, you know, how on earth, has it, has it come to this that you're now having to say these things? But we both feel it's 100% right. Mm -hmm. And it's been a very, I suppose, you know, you go through testing times in your life mm -hmm. uh, and things happen. And I wouldn't change this. For, well, I would rather the pandemic hadn't happened. That, that goes without saying. I would rather none of it had happened. But it having happened and, and Trudy and I having taken the path that we have, I am content that we've done right. And, you know, I've, I feel as if, I've, you know, we've, we've both been sort of tested in a way mm. and, I, and, I'm, and I'm content that we've done, we've done the right thing. Mm. And, and so, yes, you know, my mum, you know, my mum has said to me, mm. you know, gosh, you know, would you not rather just go back to the old way and just, you know, doing the things that you used to do? And I say, well, in some, in some ways, yes, but in other ways, no. Mm. If, the, if, this is, if this is the situation, then I am content yeah. that I'm, I, I had to, all I did was say what I thought was right. Mm. I haven't really done any more than that. Mm. I just f felt confronted by a challenge and felt moved to say I thought things were wrong mm. and should be done differently. And I, I don't have any, I don't have one iota of regret about that. Well, Neil, I think that's a pretty nice place to end. I'd like to talk for two more hours, but <laughs> this is saying... How are, th Leanne, how are things in New Zealand? How, how, are, how, are, how are things? How are, I've got less than a minute, so, on the Zoom. But how are things in oh. New Zealand? I'd say things... I'd say we're all a bit shell-shocked, to be honest mm -hmm. with you, if I'm truthful. Mm, and it's been quite a hard autumn because the, the we, we didn't... We escaped it in the South for a very long time, for two years, and this year... Everyone I know has been sick and everyone has been, and my son's tried to move to another city three times and always come back because of restrictions or lockdowns, you know. So, yeah, there's been lots of challenges and lots of obstacles. Mm -hmm. And I think everyone's, everyone's a bit worn out, actually, and a bit, um, and over the fear, uh, mostly, you know, yep. the fear of living and the fear. Everyone I know, I mean, I still hide behind a mask because I'm conditioned to it now, you know, and that's sort of sad, isn't it? I've <laughs> never worn a mask, Leanne. <laughs> I've never worn one. No, he has not. And that was the wonderful Neil Oliver from Stirling, Scotland, talking to us here on South Beat.